chapter 3, and commencing to read from verse 1, please. It's a familiar portion from the Word of God, and Genesis chapter 3 holds for us tonight the greatest tragedy that ever hit this world. The greatest tragedy that ever hit this world. The greatest tragedy ever to hit this world was when man fell into sin, bringing separation and bringing death. And so we come to Genesis chapter 3, and the Word of God reminds us tonight in verse 1, Now the serpent was more subtle than any beast of the field which the Lord God had made. And he said unto the woman, Yea, hath God said, Ye shall not eat of every tree of the garden? And the woman said unto the serpent, We may eat of the fruit of the trees of the garden, but of the fruit of the tree which is in the midst of the garden, God hath said, Ye shall not eat of it, neither shall ye touch it, lest ye die. And the serpent said unto the woman, Yea, ye shall not surely die. For God doth know that in the day ye eat thereof, then your eyes shall be opened, and ye shall be as gods knowing good and evil. And when the woman saw that the tree was good for food, and that it was pleasant to the eyes, and a tree to be desired to make one wise, she took of the fruit thereof, and did eat, and gave also unto her husband with her, and he did eat. And the eyes of them both were opened, and they knew that they were naked, and they sewed fig leaves together, and made themselves aprons. And they heard the voice of the Lord God walking in the garden in the cool of the day, and Adam and his wife hid themselves from the presence of the Lord God amongst the trees of the garden. And the Lord God called unto Adam and said unto him, Where art thou? And he said, I heard thy voice in the garden, and I was afraid because I was naked and I hid myself. And he said, Who told thee that thou wast naked? Hast thou eaten of the tree whereof I have commanded thee, that thou shouldest not eat? Verse 9, And the Lord God called unto Adam, and said unto him, Where art thou? Now I want you to come with me now to Matthew's Gospel. The Gospel of Matthew, please, in chapter 2. The Gospel of Matthew, chapter 2. The Gospel of Matthew, chapter 2, verse 1. Now when Jesus was born in Bethlehem of Judea in the days of Herod the king, Behold, there came wise men from the east to Jerusalem, saying, Where is he that is born King of the Jews? For we have seen his star in the east, and are come to worship him. When Herod the king had heard these things, he was troubled in all Jerusalem with him. And when he had gathered all the chief priests and the scribes of the people together, he demanded of them where Christ should be born. And they said unto him in Bethlehem of Judea, For thus it is written by the prophet, And thou, Bethlehem, in the land of Judah, art not the least among the princes of Judah. For out of thee shall come a governor that shall rule my people Israel. Then Herod, when he had privily called the wise men, inquired of them diligently what time the star appeared. And he sent them to Bethlehem and said, Go and search for diligently for the young child. And when ye have found him, bring me word again that I may come and worship him also. And when they heard the king, they departed. And lo, the star which they saw in the east went before them, till it came and stood over where the young child was. And when they saw the star, they rejoiced with exceeding great joy. And when they were come into the house, they saw the young child with Mary, his mother, and fell down and worshipped him. And when they had opened their treasures, they presented unto him gifts of gold and frankincense 
and myrrh. And we know that the Lord will bless those readings of His own precious truth. In Genesis chapter 3, we have the question tonight, where art thou? And in Matthew's gospel chapter 2 tonight, we have a second question, where is he? Walking down a street in Chicago of 1984, Ted Forbes found an old worn wallet lying on the pavement as he was walking by. As he opened the wallet, he searched for any identification as to who, whom this old worn wallet would belong to. There was nothing inside the wallet apart from just three dollars. Ted Forbes was an honest Christian man, as all Christians are to be honest. And he was determined to return the old worn wallet that he had found on the pavement that day, which only contained three dollars. He searched the wallet again. He went through all the different compartments of the wallet. But this time he found at the bottom of one of the compartments an envelope that had, been, that had been folded many times. It was quite evident that the envelope had been there for some time because it was very tattered and it was torn in a number of places. Retrieving the envelope from the old worn wallet, Ted Forbes could only make the writing out on the back of the envelope, which was the return address. Finding out for more information, Ted Forbes opened the envelope and took it out a letter that he found was written on June the 6th, 1924. Sixty years had almost passed when this letter was originally written. The content of the letter was written by a young lady by the name of Hannah Marshall expressing to her young boyfriend how much she loved him, expressing to him that she will always, as long as she lives, continue to love him. The letter went on to say that even though she loved him and always would love him, yet through spite her parents had forbidden her to see him anymore. He checked out the return address on the envelope, and after a number of, of days, he located to where this house was. He parked the car on the driveway and walked up to the, the house that was there and knocked the door and waiting patiently for someone to come along to open the door. Quite an elderly lady opened the door, and Ted Forbes shared with her the story of the old worn wallet that he desperately wanted to return to the owner. He asked the lady, did anyone by the name of Hannah or Michael live in this home? And sadly, no, none had ever lived in that home. Then she said, hold on a wee minute. We purchased this house of a family 30 years ago. And one thing I do know, the daughter of the house was by the name of Hannah. It may help you to know, sir, said the lady. Shortly after we purchased this house, Hannah's mother was, took a stroke and was placed into a nursing home just three blocks down from her you're standing. Ted Forbes got into the car and went to the, went to the nursing home and explained the story to the nursing advisor there, only sadly to be, to be told that Mrs. Marshall died three months after she was admitted there. 
The nursing advisor was very kind. She said, I'm not busy at the moment, but I'll go to the old records that we store, and I'll see if I can turn up Mrs. Marshall's name and see if we can get a contact number for her daughter, Hannah. After quite a search, they came across the book that held the record, and there Hannah's name came along with her number. With some excitement in his heart, Ted rang the number. But unfortunately, Hannah no longer lived there. She herself had moved into a, an, an elderly nursing home. After quite some time, he located the nursing home and went and found Hannah's apartment. She lived on the third floor. And Ted went to the door of the, of the apartment there and knocked the door and waited for someone to come. This gray-haired lady opened the door, brightly eyed, and he shared with her the story of the old worn wallet. Are you by any chance, Ted asked, a lady called Hannah? Yes, that's my name, she said. My name's Hannah Marshall. She says, he said, I have found this old worn wallet, and I retrieved from this wallet this letter Perhaps you would like to read it for yourself to see, is it yours? She wasn't reading it all that long when suddenly tears come streaming down her face. She said, you know, I loved Michael so much. In fact, I loved him so much I could never bring myself to love anybody else. I've always loved him, and there never has been a day that I never thought about him. Do you know where Michael lives, she asked, because if you find Michael, wherever he is, however he is, please tell him that I have always loved him, and there never was a day that I didn't think about him. I certainly will, said Ted. He left Hannah that day and was leaving the apartment where she was staying, and as he was walking out through, he was carrying the old worn wallet in his hand, and one of the workers who worked there stopped him leaving and said, excuse me, sir, can I see the wallet that's in your hand? He says, that's Michael Goldstein's wallet. Where did you find that wallet? He's never done losing it. Michael says, I'm only after finding it the, about a month ago out there uh, in one of the streets. He says, do you know this wallet? And of course, he shared with the man the story of, the, of how he found the wallet and the letter that was inside. Oh, yes, he says, Michael Goldstein, he lives on the eighth floor. With a sheer of excitement, Ted got into the elevator and pressed number eight. Up he went. Went to, the apartment went to the apartment door, knocked the door, and waited for the gentleman to come. He thought nobody was in, and suddenly, suddenly, the door opened. Are you Michael Goldstein? asked Ted. Yes, that's me. He showed him the old worn wallet and said, is this yours by any chance? That is mine, he said. He says, if you don't mind, sir, inside this wallet there was a letter that I took out and read. And he showed him the letter. And as he read the letter, he began to cry. He says, you know, that was a girl who I loved when I was only a young lad. And he said, I actually never married myself because I could never bring myself to love anybody more than what I ever loved Hannah. In fact, Hannah is in my thoughts every day. Then he asked the question, can you tell me, do you know where Hannah lives? He says, of course I do. She lives three floors, five floors below. The old man was greatly excited, and he took Ted's hand and walked with him down into the elevator, down into the third floor, 
he walked him right up to Hannah's door and knocked Hannah's door, and Hannah came to the door. Both of them, after 60 years, looked into each other's face. And after a few moments, Michael walked forward. He put his arms around Hannah. And after 60 long years of separation, that suddenly evaporated in the sense of their love for one another. Three weeks after that coming together, Ted Forbes received a phone call from Michael. He says, Ted, Ted, it's Hannah. It's Hannah. Hannah has said yes. I've proposed, and we're getting married next month, and no better man could I ask for to be the best man than to be you. And Hannah, 76 years of age, and Ted was 79 years of age, got wedded, wedded, and the day was so wonderful. What a perfect ending to a tragic separation. You know, friend, they had every reason to celebrate, every reason to celebrate as they finally came together. A moving true story, that is, a tragic separation brought about through spite tonight. God wants tonight to bring your attention to a more tragic separation. Separation tonight, not through spite, but through tonight what the Bible calls sin. And for these brief few moments, God wants to speak to you tonight, my dear unsaved friend, first and foremost of His never-ending love for you. First of all, God wants to speak to us all tonight concerning God's search for man. My friend, tonight, this tragic separation is not between a boy and a girl. It's not tonight between a man and a woman. This tragic separation tonight is about between man and his Maker. Oh, my dear unsafe friend, tonight, my dear unsafe friend, tonight, you are separated from your Maker. Tonight, sin has brought you apart from God. And but God tonight, but God in spite of sin has never stopped loving you. In spite tonight of what has happened, in spite of tonight, when we look in Genesis chapter 3, in spite of what Adam done, in spite of what Adam had done, friends, listen, God didn't move in judgment. God moved in mercy. God searched for the man that was lost. God searched for Adam, the man who had sinned. God didn't judge him. God didn't wipe him out. No, God searched for him. Adam... Adam, where? Where art thou? Oh, dear unsafe friend tonight, that's the question God is asking you tonight. Where art thou? God knows exactly where you are tonight, but the question's asked because God wants to make sure that you know where you are tonight. Because of sin tonight, you're separated from God. 
You may ask me tonight, George, tell me, does whatever happened in the Garden of Eden, does it affect me? What happened back in Genesis 3, does it, has it anything to do with me? My friend, it has everything to do with you. Romans chapter 5 and verse 12 says this, As by one man sin entered the world, and death by sin, so death has reigned upon all men, for all have sinned. And my friend, that day when Adam sinned in the Garden of Eden, listen, he didn't drive himself from the presence of God. He drove the whole of mankind that followed after from the presence of God. And my friend, this evening, listen to me. Listen to me. Even though Adam sinned, God searched. Even though Adam, friend, brought in the great curse into this world, yet God called, Adam, where art thou? Unsaved friend tonight, how do you answer God's question? It's not my question, it's God's question. Where? Where art thou? Every sinner, every sinner, every sinner needs to know where they are. My dear unsaved friend tonight, my sinner friend tonight, do you realize where you are this evening? Tonight you are on the broad road that leads to hell and to destruction. Oh, sinner friend, do you realize tonight you're abiding under the judgment and the wrath of God? But oh, dear unsaved friend, tonight, listen. Do you realize tonight where you are? You leave yourself without hope as far as the great eternity is concerned. Where art thou tonight? You see, friend, tonight, mankind is lost. Every sinner tonight is lost, but every sinner tonight is loved. Every sinner is separated tonight from God. But God searches for the sinner. No friend tonight. In Genesis 3 and verse 10, this is what Adam had to say. He said, I heard thy voice in the garden, and I was afraid. That day when God searched for Adam, Adam heard something that made him afraid. Adam heard tonight, Adam heard the voice of God. You know, my dear friend, tonight, Sometimes God's voice is heard. Sometimes God's voice is heard in such a way we cannot help but hear it. Sometimes God's call and God's voice comes through sickness. Sometimes God's voice can be heard through sickness. A man lying on the broad of his back, it's the only time perhaps where God can get him to listen. How many friends have heard God's call through sickness? Sometimes for, man, for God to get man to listen, God's voice was heard through death. I could take you to a home tonight I could take you to two homes. And God spoke to people. 
when the coffin came through their door. December 2004, coming home from a carol service, a young lady had only got her driving license. She was 17. Her 11-year-old brother was in the car with her, and he was saved in August of 2004 through a holiday Bible club. On their way home from the Mai that night, the young lassie misjudged at a T-junction and drove out in front of a car. The wee eleven-year-old fella was killed outright. When the undertakers brought the young lad home in his coffin, the father said, when they brought us into the room to see him, God spoke to me. He says, you're we lads with me. Where are you? This is what he said. He said, for 10 years, God has been speaking to me. And 10 years, I have been troubled. But God had to allow my wee lad to come home in a coffin so that I would listen to his voice. Ah, sometimes God's voice has to come through sickness, love. And sometimes God's voice has to come through tragedies. But when we hear God's voice, you'll not mock God's voice. Because God can voice tonight can make the sinner tremble. Where art thou tonight? Friend, another year has almost gone. And tonight, friend, remember, God has been so merciful to you. Friend, you've been spared thus far. Think of the others who haven't, but you are. And tonight in this gospel meeting, perhaps God is searching for you. Friend, God tonight wants to draw your attention to the old rugged cross. Yes, the old rugged cross, because that's where sin brought separation between God and His Son so that you could be found. Sinner tonight, seek. Friend tonight, look to the cross and see the one that hung and bled and suffered there for you and died there as the Lamb of God, one tonight forsaken by God so that you could be found by God. Friend tonight, look to Calvary's cross. Friend, there's no greater ground tonight where God searches for the lost sinner than to search at the place called Calvary. Friend, every sinner is found at Calvary. Every sinner is found at the foot of the old rugged cross. Tell me to come with me to Calvary's cross. Come tonight and hear God calling yet again. Where? Where art thou? And you know, friend, it's at the old rugged cross tonight. Aye. It was an old worn wallet that was the emblem that brought a man and a woman together again after 60 years of separation. But remember tonight, it's at the old rugged cross where God and sinners comes together again. It was at the cross, at the cross tonight, where I first saw the light. And I'll tell you this, it was there where the burden of my heart rolled away. Where art thou tonight? God searched Adam tonight. God searches you. 
Why does God search for you tonight, unsafe friend? It's because God has never ceased and God has never stopped loving you. Sinner friend tonight, you're loved. You're loved by God. Calvary spells it out tonight in capital letters. God is love. And tonight God asks the question, where art thou? God search for a man. Yea, but then there's man search for God. Matthew's Gospel, chapter 2. We hear the question asked, Where is he that is born, King of the Jews? You know, friend, tonight when God created mankind, he created mankind in his own image. That means tonight there is a part in man tonight that searches for God but doesn't know it. Men are searching for life tonight in all things. And yet, friend, tonight it's the Lord Jesus who said, I am come that they might have life and that they might have it more abundantly. You know, friend, these wise men made a mistake that night so long ago. They came to the wrong place to find him. They not only came to the wrong place, to find him, they came to the wrong person. There's many tonight like the wise men. They're searching for God, but they're going to the wrong place. And they're going to the wrong person. You know, friend, there's people tonight desperate to find God, and they're trying to find God in all places. You searching tonight. You know, friend, mankind tonight, every man, every woman born into this world is born with a soul. And because of sin, there's a vacuum within man's heart that cries out for God, but the devil has them blinded from the reality of it. I searched. And you know, friend, tonight, there's people in Kilkeel tonight who know they're searching for something, but they don't realize that they're searching for God. I searched for life. I searched for satisfaction. I searched for it all in the places of the world. And I'll tell you something now, I'm not going to condemn any young person trying to search for it because that's where I searched myself. I searched for life. I searched for satisfaction in the world. But I can tell you now, friend, I'll confess tonight sin has its pleasures. I can tell you tonight as one sin has its pleasures. Sin has its attractions, and I ain't going to bluff you up here. Sin has its attraction. But you know what the Bible says? The pleasures of sin are but for a season. And when that season comes to an end, man's heart is empty. And I remember that night, friend, sitting in Avon Corns' bar stool, and God removed from my heart as if it were that night a bung that just drained me from every pleasure that I had in the world. And I was left that night a very empty and a very lonely young man, and little did I know I was searching for God, but I didn't know it. Is there someone here tonight, and that's the way you feel? You feel so empty. You feel so lonely. Friend, that's where sin leaves you tonight, and tonight you're searching. Sam Workman always said this, and I have to stand with him. He said, people are searching for the right thing, but they're looking for it in the wrong place. The wise men searched for him, but they searched for him in the wrong place. They searched for him through the wrong person. 
where is he? But that night the star brought them to the very place, and it was there they found him. You know, friend, tonight you can find Christ tonight. You'll not find him as a child. You'll not find him as a babe. You'll find him as a loving Savior. And you can find him tonight, friends. As he searches for you, you perhaps are searching for him. And tonight you can come together at the place called Calvary. You'll not, find him in a th you'll not find him through a church. You'll not find him through creeds. You'll not find him through sacraments. You'll only find God through Christ. What did the Lord Jesus say in John 14 and 6? He says, I am the way, the truth, the life. No man, no matter whether he's orange man, Hibernian man, black man, white man, yellow man, no man cometh to the Father. No man cometh to the Father but by me. Friend, that's not a church you need. It's not a creed you need. It's Christ you need. Christ tonight opened the very gates of heaven, the gate of heaven, and tonight he says, I am the door, and by me if any man enters in, he shall be saved. Lost sinner tonight. Lost sinner tonight. If you're searching, your searching finishes here. And your search finishes now. Because I bring before you the Christ of God, who's the only Savior of sinners. And I'll warn you tonight, reject him, you reject God. You receive him, you receive God. For him that saith me, Christ saith, saith him that sent me. Friend, tonight, sin brings about tonight the most tragic separation that there is. An old worn wallet was an emblem used to bring two together, but listen, it's through the work that took place on an old rugged cross that brings God and the sinner together. Where art thou tonight? That's God's question to you, my sinner friend. Where art thou? But is there a one tonight who perhaps could be asking the question, where is he who was born king of the Jews? Where is he? Tonight, you can find him as you bow the knee by faith and you'll find him as your Savior. Let's take a wee moment and we'll bow in prayer together. Every head bowed, every eye closed. Listen, friend, tonight. This is God's message. This, is, this ain't my message. This is God's message. Tonight, you need to know where you are. But you need to know that you can come tonight. Come with all your sin. Come tonight with all your excuses. Come tonight and leave them there and trust the Son of God as your Savior. Our Father God tonight, Lord, yet again you have warned us concerning the truth of sin. And yet, Lord, through thy word tonight, we have learned of the love of God. Tonight we see and have been brought again to that old rugged cross. 
And I pray tonight that through God the Holy Spirit, some soul will be sought and found tonight. And Lord, we pray that they will see tonight that now is, the, is that accepted time, and behold, now is the day of salvation. Lord, give the saving grace, we pray, because it's in our Savior's name we ask it. Amen. And amen. 200, please, and 73 in the red hymn book is our closing hymn. And listen tonight, friends, if there's somebody here and you're troubled about your soul and you'd like to speak to someone, please come and see me or come and see someone tonight. We are your servants for Christ's sake. Please don't leave it. Come tonight. It's only a step to Jesus. Then why not take it now? Come and thy sin confessing to him thy Savior bow to.